I think we are live right now. Hello and welcome everyone to today's edition of Welcome Change, the first time we are live in 2021. Hoping the year gets better as it, as it develops. Um, those who are joining us for the first time here, and I know we have visitors joining us from around the world, um, every two weeks, Ashoka US is hosting a half hour um, news hour, if you so want to say. We are presenting insights, wisdom, and solutions from social entrepreneurs about a pressing social issue. And uh, my name is Constanza Frischen. I'm the leader here of Ashoka in North America. And today's guest here with me is Albert Fox Khan. Albert, welcome. You are the founder and the ED of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. And uh, we'll be learning more about Albert's work about fighting for privacy in the age of digital surveillance, getting policing, digital policing back under citizens control and oversight um, over the course of the next approximately 30 minutes. First by a conversation that Albert and I will be having. And then um, there's also the Q&A button you should be able to see if you join us from a laptop or a PC where you can type in your questions. And so we'll be field, we fielding a couple of them and, uh, and ask Albert more about uh, his work. All right. So with that being said, let's get right in and let's start. Albert, we said this before, you are uh, heading the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. The short abbreviation for that is STOP. Your URL is stopspying.org, and it brings us right to the core. I think your work is about defending our constitutional rights against surveillance, against over-policing, about, it's about upholding democracy. And uh, I just read your most recent article for Wired that you wrote after the attack on the Capitol and um, there is a growing chorus of voices that say, um, in order to prevent such an attack from happening again, we need more digital surveillance. We need, this was a failure of um, our policing system, of our law enforcement system. So what do you say? Well, Constanza, thank you first uh, for having me, for having this conversation. And, you know, I, I think, Right now we're at this really historic moment where we've seen the halls of Congress breached for the first time in you know, uh, more than two centuries. And you know, like so many Americans, my, my blood was boiling when I, when I saw that. And I, I wanted to do whatever I could to find the people behind this, to hold them accountable, to reassert the rule of law at a moment when we see an attempt to overthrow democracy itself. But very quickly we saw that rather than addressing the reasons for this police failure to hold the capital secure, people were simply doubling down on the tired old tropes of giving police sweeping new surveillance tools. And for me, that's very alarming because I view surveillance technology as completely interwoven with the broader campaign by our police departments to systematically target communities of color, the racist history of American policing and the over surveillance of LGBTQ plus communities and so many other historically marginalized groups that have been targeted not because they pose a threat to the law, but because of who they are, because mm -hmm. they their very identity is seen as a threat. And so what we saw at the Capitol was a police department that had plenty of tools, but was unwilling to use those tools against attackers who were white and mm. conservative. And I deeply fear that if we respond to this attack with an expanded facial recognition program and normalization of geolocation data collection with some of the other more invasive tools that are being suggested by both pundits and law enforcement boosters, we're going to in very short order see those same tools being targeted at the same communities of color that have so often been targeted, not at the right-wing extremists that were behind this attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we would exacerbate the problem rather than um, solving anything. And apart from that, you mentioned also in your article, which I thought was spot on, you know, uh, the terrorists basically put their own names and uh, pictures and video feeds on social media. So it was... They, they revealed their identity themselves, right? Without facial recognition. Exactly. This isn't a, a hard case to solve in many instances. People were live streaming felonies. They were, you know, giving uh, their names to reporters. They were 
gleeful about committing these crimes and and you know in large numbers they were willing to do it with you know openly and so really i you know i think with nothing more sophisticated than a 1-800 number a tip line and a few wanted posters were able to get the vast majority of people who took part in this horrific attack and so i've been very nervous to see people claim without evidence that there's this necessity to use these new tools to, to solve this case when there really has been so much openness about how it was planned, how it was supported, and how it was committed. Hmm. So let's understand um, the amount of digital surveillance a little bit more. And the tricky thing is it's, it's so often invisible that uh, you know, it's hard for the average citizen to get a sense for the amount of spying that is occurring um, day in, day out, especially for communities of color and immigrants and LGBTQ plus communities, as you say. So perhaps, Albert, you, your work is uh, mostly in New York. So let's use that as an example. Give us some detail about the amount of digital surveillance in New York. Yeah, so you walk out of your apartment building and you're being photographed. You go to the subway, you're being photographed. You walk into your office building and you're being photographed. And every step along the way, facial recognition uh, it, software is able to record your location. And layered on top of that biometric surveillance, we see social media monitoring. We see geolocation data pulling our location from our phones, using them as a virtual tracking device for the highest bidder, even when that bidder is the police themselves. And you know, part of why I started STOP is because this debate has been going on for, for decades at the federal level. And I remember as a senior in high school, we were having a debate about Section 215 of the Patriot, Patriot Act and expanding government surveillance authorities. And you flash forward to Edward Snowden and he's releasing documents showing how Section 215 has been abused. And you flash forward to even this year, and we're still having a debate about Section 215. And we had had this stalemate at the federal level while at the state and local level, we had seen really the sea change in how this technology was being used as it became normalized, as it became cheaper, as it became used both by government agencies and private citizens. And so we've created this just truly staggering surveillance web across New York. And we're, you know, thanks to legislation we just passed, we're, we're starting to get more information uh, about how it yeah. operates. But yeah. sitting here today, I, I sadly don't know the full scope of it. There, yeah. And what keeps me up at night are the tools that I don't know about yet. Yeah, yeah. So we get to your solution in um, a few seconds but to drive this uh, down a little further. So I think you mentioned, you, you know that there were at least over 20,000 facial um, recognition searches over the last two years, I think three years in New York. So that means, correct? Yeah, so yeah, we in a lawsuit we filed, we found that they had used facial recognition here in New York 22,000 times in just the last three years. Yeah, yeah. And, and so and we're still fighting to find out whether that was graffiti cases or turnstile evasion. Like, right. or is this becoming a part of how we prosecute even the most minor crimes? Right. And so that might mean, um, like, let's say I take part in a demonstration exercising my First Amendment rights, but it might end up getting me into a database, right, where I'm being cataloged and can be can be searched. Exactly. And this is really just an extension of the historical practices we've had in New York of using analog surveillance, even since the colonial era, to track political dissent in communities of color. You know, in, in New York, mm. we used to have lantern laws, which would require Black slaves and indigenous peoples to carry a lantern whenever they were outside their home so they could be tracked more easily using the technology of that time. And then we saw that advance into undercover units and uh, wiretaps and all these analog technologies in the 20th century. And those were used to systematically monitor uh, anti-war protests, civil rights movements and other political movements. And now today with a single photograph and facial recognition technology, you can carry out the sort of mass surveillance of a political demonstration that would have taken hundreds of officers, so much manpower, so much investment in the past. And really that lack of 
cost to carrying out this surveillance has been one of the biggest changes, not the yeah. desire yeah. by the police to do it, but the fact it's so cheap and so easy. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point, what you're saying. You can sort of monitor and surveil and police anyone you consider to be the enemy, which is mostly, you know, who you're biased against in communities of, of color, and just sort of surveil them at no cost because it's so easy to scale. And what I thought was really interesting, um, we had a conversation at a different time where you said, like, historically, you know, the Fourth Amendment, which shields citizens from... Um, overzealous efforts of, you know, state search and warrants, et cetera, had been kept in check, as you say, because it was so expensive, you know, you, when you had to dispatch a group of officers to follow a suspect, et cetera, et cetera. And now it's just, you can scale it for free. Exactly. And so we had what I call economic particularity, where we were forced, uh, where law enforcement was forced to be uh, narrow in their searches just because of the resource constraints of being able to track people with the tools of the time. You know, it takes a lot of money to have a group of officers on a surveillance team and rotating shifts track mm -hmm. where someone walks around a city, but you can buy my app data from a third party vendor for pennies and you can go to Google with a geolocation warrant for free. And, and so that has been one of the most momentous shifts in, in our uh, legal structure. And another issue is just the fact that our concept of privacy in our fourth amendment doctrine in our legal doctrine is really decades behind what we consider privacy in, in actual daily life because so much of the data we that we consider intimate about ourselves is held by third party companies, which under the law are considered, uh, you know, basically uh, free uh, grounds for the police to search. But for us, you know, that folder on a Google Drive, that can be as intimate as anything found in our house. Yeah, it's very likely that this is where my, my pictures are stored and not like, you know, on the shelf behind me. So Albert, let's go to, uh, from describing the problem that, you know, you just um, did so well right now to describing where you intervene. And I think many will guess you're a lawyer by training. You were updated, <laughs> you were so saying basically, look, the law is outdated. We need to update it um, and make it fit the digital age. And um, you are doing this in many different ways. You are forging community coalitions. You are... Um, pushing ahead with legislation, with litigation. And um, so give us, give us an example of how STOP um, activates citizens to take back control. So I do have the misfortune of being a lawyer and there is this bias that you have as a lawyer that every time you see a problem, you assume that law is the solution. And I think it's part of the solution, but I was an activist long before as a lawyer, as a 12 year old, I was in the streets protesting against police violence. As a teenager, I was helping form interfaith uh, coalitions. And that community centered work, I think is indispensable to any effective reform movement, to any effective effort to abolish mass surveillance as we seek at STOP. Because there's so many interdependent uh, uh, power structures that help enable or block surveillance. So by working to pass new laws that we can then enable additional legislation, but none of that's possible without public education campaigns to democratize this debate. Because right now it's oftentimes so technical, both in terms of the technology and in terms of the legal structures when we're having these conversations, but this is something that affects all of us. And in, at this moment in history, we need this to be a debate that engages everyone who is affected because that uh, otherwise we are undermining the democratic process itself. Mm -hmm. So that public outreach is indispensable, building uh, toolkits to help people take privacy into their own hands, but premised on the idea that one size fits none when we're addressing privacy, because everyone has different privacy threats and needs depending on what their background is, depending on the threats that are in their life, depending on the power structures they face. And, and so in a relatively short amount of time, we've managed to build up class action uh, litigation, uh, challenging the NYPD and private surveillance vendors. We've written multiple laws at the city and state level. 
We've advocated for their passage. We've done a tremendous amount of work in the media because in our uh, in New York in particular, the media is such a potent power structure itself in determining the, both the scope of the debates we have about policing and how lawmakers ultimately uh, vote. But we've also uh, you know, organized rallies and had people come to City Hall and engage in that sort of grassroots work. But um, yeah, it's, uh, you've been active at so many levels. And one major win for you guys was last, for all of us, was last year in June when um, the POST Act was passed in New York. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what that is. Yeah, this bill is basically my baby. It's I, I have, <laughs> I've been nurturing it since the day it was introduced. And it was part of the reason I founded STOP was because I thought that an organization like ours was very important in getting it enacted. This bill is the first surveillance reforms in New York City in a generation. It requires the NYPD to disclose every single surveillance tool they're using to describe how it's gathering information, to describe what the policies are on how that information is retained. and importantly, how that information is potentially shared with third parties, such as the FBI and even ICE. Because even in a so-called sanctuary city, we continue to see information that is collected by our state and local officials being passed through to federal partners, including immigration officials. And I'm so excited that just yesterday, the NYPD complied with the law. They published reports on dozens of different systems. And now we're uh, putting together a summary for the public of what's been published. And we'll be actually leading a campaign to have New Yorkers comment on these technologies and to use that comment process to push back on some of the more abusive systems like facial recognition. So it's the first step of having information or transparency about the scope of the, of the infringement, right, of constitutional rights. And then there's the possibility to move on from that and start with, with litigation, I guess. Exactly. So the POST Act is a first step. In, in some ways, it's a very modest first step, but it was so symbolic, especially in a city where the NYPD is so powerful, where our, our collective trauma from 9-11 is such a potent obstacle to national security reforms. And so having this as a first step so we can actually educate the public on how our dollars are being used to purchase these systems, what is being done in our name, and then to carry on this work, both to litigate against unconstitutional forms of surveillance, but to pass additional laws so that we can actually empower our elected lawmakers and perhaps even an uh, independent civilian commission to oversee the NYPD surveillance program and to ban those tools that they disapprove of. Mm. And what I'm finding, you know, remarkable about your work is that when you say we, it is not, you know, Albert and stop. It is um, a coalition of organizations that together drive these um, new policy pushes and, you know, draft new legislation um, together with an array of, you know, coalition partners that you assembled, including uh, major law firms. Um, so say a little bit more about how that works. So part of our theory of change was there's so many organizations out there that believe in the need to uh, push back against the growth of surveillance. And it's something they believe in, but it's not their top priority. It's not their second priority. It keeps falling down and down the list. But when you're able to provide a space to convene these groups, to uh, allow them an easy way to amplify the effort, they're eager to do that. And so we got more than a hundred different civil rights and community-based organizations to support the POST Act. We've had dozens of other organizations as part of other campaigns, such as uh, Press campaigns on geolocation data collection uh, and on uh, facial recognition more broadly. And we've built something called the Privacy New York Coalition, which includes dozens of organizations from around the country that are joining us to make New York a test case for privacy reforms more broadly. And the law firms have been really vital partners in this as well. You know, in our first year, we received more than 1.2 million in free legal services from leading law firms that partnered with us to litigate these cases, to write research reports, to help amplify our, uh, our efforts because they believe in this mission as well. And their associates have been, you know, really 
so anxious to find ways to fight for the things they believe in, even at a time when they're, you know, working for uh, for profit law firms. I see the first uh, couple of questions come in here through Q&A and one is very related to uh, what you were just saying. It's, um, are you seeing that there is a mindset, a mindset shift taking place that uh, what used to be dismissed and eh, doesn't really matter that much, you know, surveillance, um, that more and more people are becoming acutely aware of that and get mobilized? Uh, so it, compared to when I first got interested in these issues as a kid, I feel like it's night and day. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, the person who's been crying wolf about this for decades and people used to dismiss it and now people are alarmed. But we also see um, some unfortunate movements in the other direction where, you know, as in the aftermath of the Capitol Hill attack, we saw people willing to suddenly go the other way and empower the police with new technologies as part of those investigations. So I think that there's this uh, ongoing threat that in moments of fear, in moments of danger, in moments when we feel at risk, we're going to go down the same predictable path of empowering police with these tools, which they then uh, weaponize against communities of color. But I definitely think that compared to, you know, years ago, decades ago, this is something that is much more a topic of everyday concern and something where we all are recognizing how we're impacted. Thank you, Albert. There are several questions he are asking um, for how far is what is happening in New York exemplary for what is happening in other places around the US? And then several questions also asking, what does that mean worldwide? Are you in a position to say what is happening in, in other countries? Yeah, so our theory of change was very much rooted in taking action locally here in New York. But as we um, were having success, we saw that there was a need to provide assistance to groups in other parts of the country that we could never parachute in and have legitimacy to do this work directly, but that there were you know, grassroots organizations who didn't have attorneys, didn't have uh, model legislation, didn't have resources, and that we could come in, do trainings, provide them uh, assistance and help them have an even larger impact in this work in their communities. So this has meant uh, helping everyone from student groups in uh, rural uh, North Carolina to groups in Washington state and even uh, some discussions with groups outside the US. And, and we do see that there are some communities that have had tremendous success uh, on their own, you know, uh, part of what inspired this work was the amazing uh, success that happened in Oakland with the creation of their privacy commission. Brian Hofer has been the chair there and done tremendous work in that community. But part of why New York is such a particular focal point for this work is both because we were one of the worst offenders in the United States with this surveillance technology. We're such a high profile uh, location and so people look to us at a, as a model for both good and for bad mm -hmm. and, and because um, you know the amount of media attention that is focused on New York as, as the media capital of the United States and so the idea is that whatever we help normalize either in terms of a surveillance state or in a, a privacy state will reverberate throughout the rest of the United States. And, mm -hmm. and we certainly hope to build out those networks of solidarity and mutual aid with organizations doing on the ground work in other parts of the world as well. Mm. There are uh, several uh, viewers commenting and I'm reading between the lines, you know, still sort of shocked about like how different the police reacts when there is a Black Lives Matter demonstration, you know, with full force and brutality and arrests. And then comparing that to what happened at the Capitol where basically, you know, white supremacists walked freely around. So um, there's an interesting question here how do you think that the laws, the legislation you pass or the tools you're working with can help to identify both, you know, when there is problematic action, like, you know, over police uh, brutality, et cetera, but also when there is lack of action, like right now. So this is something that's been keeping me up at night as well. Uh, we actually, so I host a surveillance podcast called Surveillance in the City, and we were talking about this a lot in the last episode, that what this calls out for me is the real need for 
democratic oversight of policing in the United States. And it brings to the forefront the fact that in many jurisdictions, there truly is no democratic accountability mechanism. And so we've created these norms of letting the police determine the you know, practical extent of our rights. And we saw police officers taking part in this attack. And, and you know, I think that there is going to be even more evidence as we go forward that there were officers who were, you know, complicit in enabling this attack and not just uh, indifferent to the threat, but actually taking measures to help. We've already seen a number of Capitol Police officers suspended. But, you know, I've organized so many protests over the years. I've organized protests in Washington, D.C. I've seen the amount of force targeted at peaceful protesters who are doing nothing more than exercising their First Amendment right in a space they are entitled to be in. And yet in those moments, I've still seen them met with with violence, with hate, with brutality. And I think this is a wake up call that, you know, we have let our police really control our citizenry rather than letting our citizenry control the police. And here in New York, there's a very poignant and uh, you know, powerful uh, analog to this in the police riot that we had in the 1980s, where then uh, US attorney Rudolph Giuliani led police officers across the Brooklyn Bridge into City Hall Park, and they then ransacked City Hall in a really chilling uh, parallel to what we saw in Washington, DC. And so I think that we are going to see even stronger calls to have civilians holding police accountable uh, in the coming months. Wow. I, um, I, you probably heard from my accent, I'm, I'm not American, so I didn't even know about, um, about this. And it just strikes me as a chilling parallel with Rudy Giuliani too, <laughs> his involvement back then and, and now. Um, thank you for that. Uh, there are several uh, questions. If I sum them up, uh, viewers are asking, how paranoid should we be if we are on Facebook um, in relation to privacy? Is it, uh, should we upload our pictures? Should we not? Do you have any um, any advice? Look, it's easy for me to put on the tinfoil hat and say you should delete everything. But the truth is that it's all about trade-offs. It's all about threat modeling. It's all about figuring out what is the risk of having this information online. But it's also not just the risk to you, but the risk to those around you, your loved ones. I think there are some easy steps we can take, like normalizing a culture of encryption, taking steps to harden our cybersecurity, those are sort of basic good cyber hygiene. Where it comes to you know taking ourselves off of these monopolistic platforms that really have uh, suppressed any alternatives to accessing these networks, it's not an easy choice. I don't pretend it is. I use a lot of these social media platforms, even though I know they provide enormous tracking information, because I I'm a very privileged ally. I'm a you know straight white man, I'm an attorney, I am someone who is insulated from a lot of these threats. But I know that many of my clients don't have that same privilege to use these platforms. And that's why I'm so focused on creating the structural safeguards that prevent the police from harnessing these platforms for anyone. So this includes uh, geolocation tracking bans and uh, facial recognition search bans that would prevent them from uh, some of the more egregious ways that they've harnessed these social media to, to track so many. Albert, that was very powerful. And we are almost at the um, end of our 30 minutes. There are still a lot of que questions coming in and I wanna pick this one here as the last one because it's um, really interesting as it goes to the core of our work. And the question is, how can we use technology to solve some of these issues? Or is there, I want to rephrase it, is there a way to use technology to solve the I think problem of surveillance? I oftentimes don't think, percent. sorry, I, I, I don't think technology is the solution for a lot of these issues. I think that community is the solution. Solidarity is the solution. Being vocal and active in local government is an indispensable part of the solution. I think that one of the things I, I, that we often fight against at STOP is the techno solutionism that we see in our you know, public policy arena where people assume because something is new and fancy and high tech that it's better, that it's more inclusive, that it's somehow objective. 
all too often, especially when we're encountering more sophisticated forms of AI bias, it's not. And, and so I really would say that uh, the thing I would want to emphasize as much as possible is to, to stay vocal, but also to stay local, to make sure that you're engaging with your local city council, your local school board, those most you know fundamental forms of local government, because that's where we actually have the, a, a potential to break through the political logjam and to actually see meaningful changes, rapid changes to reshape the norms and protections we have around these technologies. Thank you so much, Albert. One last point, I was thinking, you know, we are coming almost full circle to the first question being like, do we need more surveillance uh, now after the attack on the Capitol? Now you're basically saying, look, the solution is really, it's, it's more community, right? More civilian oversight. So it just had me reflect that in the end, you know, it's human behavior that makes the difference regardless of, of, of what kind of fancy tools you put in someone's hands, right? And it's this human behavior and sort of moral parameters for that, that, that we, where we must ensure that technology is being used for the good of all. And then there is, as you say, that communities in the end control what is happening rather than the other way around, that is technology controls communities. Exactly. It's all about coming back and re reinvigorating and reinvesting in democracy. Thank you so much, Albert. It was a fascinating uh, 30 minutes. I think we covered a lot. So um, thank you for being here with us, for being such a you know, quick thinker, uh, great speaker. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, everyone should see uh, in the chat uh, Albert's and Stop's um, Twitter handles and websites. So you're invited to follow along. And I hope everyone um, is coming again to this place in two weeks time to hear our next uh, conversation. And we'll follow up with uh, more a summary of today and articles over the coming week. So thank you so much. And Albert, have a good day. And thank you for all you do. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, as always, for all the support from the Ashoka Network. Thank you. Bye, everyone.